Welcome everyone. Um, tonight we are going to share a recorded presentation from last week. Um, so bear with me while I share my screen and then afterwards we'll have time for live questions. Um, so I know that's a little unusual, but um, it's all the same material. So let me get started. Alexa, welcome everyone. This is our second information session for the Meadow Housing Project. And we have a presentation for you that will be followed by a Q&A session. We're going to be keeping track of questions in the chat, and then we will share that as well as the video from this session after we're done. So first, some introductions. I'm Terry Harding. I'm the project manager for House Bill 2001, also known as the Middle Housing Code Project. I'm the principal planner for the long range planning team, and I've worked for the city for 15 years. I'm excited to be here. And I'll have Sophie introduce herself. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us this rainy October afternoon. I'm Sophie McGinley. My pronouns are she and her. I'm an assistant planner with community planning and design. I've been with the city for about two and a half years, and I'm the public engagement lead for the Middle Housing Project. And I'll pass it over to Jeff. Thanks, Sophie. Uh, my name is Jeff Gepper. I'm senior planner on the short range planning team, and I'm here for technical expertise on the draft code. And I will hand it off to Jen Mack. Hey, um, I'm Jennifer Knapp, and I'm an urban designer, and I've been with the city for about 10 years. Awesome. Thanks, team. We also have a couple of planning commissioners here in attendance. They're just here listening. Um, the planning commission's public hearing, as some of you might know, is scheduled for November 16th. So that's when you'll get to give your comments directly to the commission, but they are, I'm glad they're here today to hear some of the questions that people have. So the next slide is our shared agreements for this meeting. We ask that you please keep yourself on mute until called upon. Put your questions in the chat and staff will moderate those questions at the end. One person should speak at a time. Please use respectful language. Try to keep your questions to under a minute if we um, invite you to unmute and ask a question live and then save your comments for the public hearing. Of, of course, you may make comments, but our purpose for the meeting today is to answer questions that you have to help you prepare your comments for the public hearing. Next slide. Great. So this project, House Bill 2001, passed the state legislature in 2019. It effectively eliminates single family only zoning in large cities across Oregon, and it's known as the Middle Housing Bill. It has a deadline of June 30th, 2022, and a set of administrative rules and a model code that are in place um, and were developed by the state. This kind of section of the presentation is some background, and then we'll get into the public involvement process and what's in the draft code and how to get involved. So what is single family zoning? As some of you may know, single family zoning refers to areas of the city that allow only one detached house per plot of land. As University of Oregon Law School professor Sarah Adams Shane and others have documented, single family zoning has exclusionary roots and has created inequities in who has access to large parts of our communities. To move forward, we must first look back and acknowledge actions in the past that have harmed and excluded members of our community. Single family zoning has a complex history that resulted in exclusion of low income, black, indigenous, and other people of color from certain neighborhoods. In Oregon, this history was especially harmful with direct exclusion of non-white people from the state from 1844 until 1926. Although those exclusions are illegal today, their negative impacts are still affecting our community through the legacy of exclusionary zoning. Housing policy and code changes are an opportunity to mitigate those. This slide shows, uh, this is the zoning map for the city of Eugene. 
And as you can see, the light yellow color is our R1 low density residential zone. It covers about 80% of our residential areas and is the place where most of the changes due to House Bill 2001 will take effect. Before single family zoning was vastly expanded after World War II, American neighborhoods contained a mix of single houses and other types of housing. By now, many of us are familiar with the term missing middle housing, coined by Daniel Paralek of Optico's Design. Housing that falls between a single detached unit and an apartment is called missing middle or just middle housing. The House bill defined middle housing to include duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, cottage clusters, and townhouses. Top three pictures on this slide are from left to right, Eugene examples of middle housing, a fourplex, a duplex, and townhomes. So middle housing isn't a new concept. It can be found in many older neighborhoods and historic districts as well as in newer mixed housing neighborhoods. But until HB 2001, new middle housing was difficult to build, only allowed in certain places, requiring special permits, public hearings, and discretionary approval processes. Once cities implement the bill, middle housing will be allowed by right in most large city neighborhoods. Here are some definitions of the types of middle housing, a duplex, is two units on a lot, a triplex is three, a fourplex or sometimes called a quadplex is four, a cottage cluster is a grouping of no fewer than four detached dwellings per acre with a footprint of less than 900 square feet each that includes a common courtyard. And lastly, the townhouses, two or more attached dwellings where each dwelling is located on an individual lot or parcel and shares at least one common wall with an adjacent dwelling. So a little bit about our project timeline and how it's different than our other projects. This one is big. It is different and it's fast. Our typical projects are city council directed, meaning that there's support from and direction coming down from our local decision makers. This project is coming from the state and city staff are working to implement it. That dynamic presented a unique challenge. Although this bill was staffed and passed in 2019, the project didn't kick off until early 2020, which means that the vast majority of the public engagement and project work has occurred over Zoom due to the pandemic. Lastly, two years is the blink of an eye in planning time. We've had to move quickly while ensuring we do things right in very unusual circumstances. At the state level, the House bill rulemaking process involved a lot of different groups and a lot of different products. It was directed by the Department of Land Conservation and Development, and those staff formed a rules advisory committee consisting of 23 members from around the state from different perspectives and stakeholder groups. A technical advisory committee with 25 members and technical expertise in various subjects. They held nine meetings and ultimately developed a set of minimum standards for cities to comply with and a model code. Those documents were adopted by the Land Conservation and Development Commission at the end of 2020. And now I'm going to pass it over to Sophie to tell you about our public involvement process. Great, thank you, Terry. So this is just an overview of some components of our public involvement process. Um, if you'd like to see more detail about the public involvement plan, I'm happy to put a link to that in the chat. The public involvement plan was approved in summer of 2020 by the Planning Commission. And because it came at kind of a weird time with the pandemic, everything was very Zoom centric. I'll, um, I'll just give an overview of these components. So one of them was the Boards and Commissions Roundtable and the uh, lists of the groups that you see here um, come from, come directly from the public involvement plan. So we had representatives from several boards and commissions. Um, they each, they held three meetings. Uh, one was focused on developing guiding values and principles for the project. 
One was focused on a technical recommendation, and then one was focused on an affordability-centric recommendation. And this word cloud came from one of their meeting summaries. Then we had a local partners roundtable. It was kind of like the counterpart to the boards and commissions roundtable. They also held three meetings focused on the exact same thing um, with a very similar but different word cloud. And um, their last meeting, they met together with the boards and commissions roundtable. Then a new thing that we tried this year was we had an equity roundtable and the equity roundtable held five meetings. It was staffed by Alayi Community Consulting um, and it, it uh, consisted of representatives from um, local organizations or nonprofits that serve underrepresented communities and participants were compensated for their time. So this was um, hoping to create an equity focus on the project. Um, and we're really excited about that work and acknowledge that although it wasn't all encompassing, it was a step in the right direction. So looking forward to doing more there. Another aspect that we had was our Healthy Democracy Lottery Selected Panel. Healthy Democracy is a Portland-based nonprofit that focuses on running deliberative democracy processes. We sent out 7,500 invitations to random households all around Eugene. And then from that, used an algorithm to select 29 random Eugenians um, from all over the city with all different experiences. They met 15 total times. Um, they used their first 10 meetings to establish shared background knowledge, and then from there made their recommendations. So it's this really iterative, deliberative process and really exciting to see that happened. Um, they were also compensated for their time and I'll go over a few exciting things from their demographics. So we had eight of the Healthy Democracy panelists under the age of 25. We don't usually see a lot of uh, younger people involved in our processes. We had representation from all city wards, including from unincorporated areas. One in six panelists identified as having a disability. Almost half of the panelists rent their homes. The panel included multiple gender identities. We also used local school age demographics from the 4J and Bethel school data because uh, those demographics are more diverse than our general population. And because this is a long range planning project, um, that's the generation that we're actually going to affect with the work that we're doing. And then lastly, educational attainment on the panel ranged from no high school diploma to advanced degrees. Then we had a community-wide survey. This was hosted on the city's online engagement platform, Engage Eugene. It received 741 responses after being open for about a month. 11 of those responses were in Spanish. Um, although we couldn't have um, in-person surveys, we did offer the opportunity to print surveys and had PDF versions as well. Then another aspect of the project is that we partnered with the University of Oregon's Planning Public Policy and Management undergraduate real world Eugene class. This class partners um, really great students with the university to do real world work. And so we had a group of four students conduct focus groups and receive um, 137 student surveys. Um, about middle housing, so that was awesome. Then we had one of those students stay on to be an intern, and he, along with another intern, developed a Gen Z GIS story map. So they made a very technical map about middle housing accessible to, um, to the Gen Z generation. So that was great. We also decided to really go virtual since it was during the pandemic. So we did a lot of social media outreach. Um, our handle is at huge planning on every platform that we're on. On Instagram, uh, we started from scratch really in August of 2019, I wanna say. Now we're up to 743 followers. I think it's 745 as of today, but not that I check. And then there's been 48, actually 49, middle housing uh, project posts. And so we've really tried to have a presence there. I hope that some of you found out about this event through our Instagram. 
Then of course we have our Facebook that has identical posts um, as our Instagram that has almost a thousand followers. And there we also hosted five Facebook live events about the connection of the middle housing project to larger topics. So we hosted one on um, climate, social justice and equity, um, communicating with Gen Z economics and transportation and transit. Lastly, I wanted to talk about Reddit. This is an online discussion forum, and we did a Q&A forum called um, an Ask Me Anything in the Eugene channel or page, and that had over 100 engagements, so that was great. And here's a graphic that you can't possibly read entirely over Zoom. Um, luckily, it's available on our webpage for you to zoom into and check it out just some um, engagement by the numbers of this project. So now after doing all of this great engagement, I wanted to talk a little bit about the technical aspects of our proposed code recommendations, which is where we are now as we approach the adoption process. So after we, after we heard from all of those groups um, and they developed their guiding values and principles for the project, one of the main themes was to go beyond what was required from the bill. So you may recall that Terry mentioned that the state created minimum standards. So that basically set a floor for what, what communities had to do to be in compliance with the bill. Then they created a model code and that model code meets the minimum standards, but exceeds it in some cases. And so that kind of modeled an approach that communities could take. We came up with three things we could do. We could either allow, which was meet the minimum standards, encourage, which was exceed them to remove barriers to middle housing, or incentivize and exceed them even more and do even more to remove barriers and lower the cost of middle housing. So anything that's attached to incentivize um, is, is to hopefully lower the cost of the, of the housing. The Equity Roundtable, Healthy Democracy Panel, Boards and Commissions Roundtable, Local Partners Roundtable, and Survey all agreed, um, the majority all agreed, to go beyond the minimum standards of the bill. Uh, this graph that you see on this slide shows that 82% of survey respondents wanted us to go beyond the minimum standards. So it was awesome that we heard so much agreement that this is the path that we should take, and that's how we proceeded. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about highlights of the proposed code. Um, I just want to say that because I'm summarizing this at a high level, it's not all encompassing. We just published yesterday this awesome guide to the adoption process that um, that has a code summary in it. And even that summary is summarized. And so um, just to make our legal team happy, um, we cannot possibly cover everything today. And we're happy to point you to the official code documents. But one of the components is that the proposed code allows um, plexes, so duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes to be attached and detached. And so this is an example that comes straight from the state showing um, two variations of this. The one on the left is an attached duplex, and the one on the right is a detached duplex. And so the definitions of these plexes end up being just you know, how the number of units on a lot, no matter how they look. Then I wanted to touch a little bit on lot size. And so for single detached dwellings, which is also just another way of saying single family dwellings, although we're switching, um, switching to single detached dwelling to comply with state law that no longer allows us to use the word family in our code. Um, so nothing is changing with those. So already the proposed minimum lot size for single detached dwellings is 4,500 square feet, and that's going to stay the same. Duplexes are proposed to be 2,250 square feet. Triplexes are proposed to be 3,500 square feet. Fourplexes are proposed to be 4,500 square feet. Townhomes don't have a minimum lot size. And then cottage clusters are 4,500 square feet. Then there's building height. And so right now the maximum building height for a single detached dwelling is 30 feet. And uh, the recommendation is to raise that to 35 feet for duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, townhouses, and cottage clusters. Then I wanted to talk a little bit about parking. So right now for single detached dwellings, you have to provide one space per, per dwelling unit. So that would be one space 
total. For duplexes, we're proposing one space for dwelling unit, so two spaces total. And then for triplexes, um, there's a range, and it basically depends on lot size. And this may look a little funny, but it comes straight from the state's minimum standards. And so that's what we base this off of. So for lots under 3,000 square feet, you would have one space per lot. Um, so it's one space total, or you'd be required to build one space. You could build more if you wanted to. For lots between 3,000 square feet and 4,999 square feet, you'd have to have two spaces per lot. And then lots over 5,000 square feet, three spaces per lot. And then we have parking continued. Fourplexes are that exact same arrangement as the triplexes. And so it goes based off of lot size with maximum four spaces per lot. For townhouses and cottage clusters, it goes back down to one space per dwelling unit total. But because we heard from our community involvement to incentivize, um, where the proposed code also proposes some parking reductions. And so no off-street parking is required if middle housing is close to transit, and we're defining close at 0.25, so a quarter mile from frequent, tra frequent transit routes. Uh, we're also allowing on-street parking credits to contribute to the off-street parking requirements. And then to try to incentivize smaller units, which in theory would be more affordable, no off-street parking is required for each middle housing dwelling unit that is small, so less than 900 square feet. And then if you also have small units, um, the minimum lot size may be reduced by 25%. And so that's just hoping again to incentivize those smaller, more affordable units. As I mentioned, we have a guide to the adoption process. It went live on our website yesterday. This is just a sneak peek at it. It has some project background. It has the code summaries, and then it has some details for how to get involved in the public hearings process and provide your input. And I'll provide a link to that in the chat after we're done. In the code summary tables within the guide, um, I just wanted to review how to read them because there's a lot of information in there. As I said, it's kind of hard to summarize uh, code. So this is an example straight from the guide and it shows the minimum lot size for a triplex. On the far left is the minimum standard that comes straight from the Oregon Administrative Rules language. Then we have the middle column, which is the language from the model code. So as I said, the language from the model code meets the minimum standards, but in some cases it exceeds it. Then on the far right, we have Eugene's proposed R1 standard. And so here you can see that the minimum standard for lot size for the triplex is 5,000 square feet. The model code says that that minimum lot size must be the same as single detached dwellings in the same zone. So that would be 4,500 square feet. And then on the right, you see our proposed standard, which is 3,500 square feet. And then it says if, if it's less or more than the minimum standard. So here we see encourage for the 3,500 square feet, since that goes beyond the minimum standard. But then we also see incentivize. And in parentheses, it says lot size requirements reduced by 25% if the triplex is composed of small, less than 900 square foot average units. So it, it shows that in some cases we have allow, encourage, incentivize, or a mix of them depending on the conditions. So that's a lot for me. I'm now gonna hand it over to Jen to talk a little bit about what all of this could look like. And I'm going to temporarily stop share or stop my screen share and pull up this awesome graphic. Hey, thank you, Sophie. Um, so what this graphic illustrates is um, possible building scenarios um, for different kinds of building types. Um, it's what's the standard now and uh, potentially what the proposed standard is. Um, these are on typical 60 by 120 um, foot lots, that's about 7,200 square foot lots, just to give you some perspective, that's fairly common in Eugene. So um, the um, example A is if someone chose to build out to the maximum 
um, potential that is allowed for a single family home. Um, so the setbacks are five feet um, on each side and a rear setback of five feet and 10 foot setback in the front. And those aren't proposed to change between um, the different kinds of building types. So um, this um, footprint is 3,600 square feet um, it's allowed to go up to 30 feet in height, at which point then if you provide a sloped peaked roof, you can go up to 37 feet at the peak. It's allowed 50% coverage. Um, scenario B is the maximum build out that's being proposed for a plex in the encourage and incentivize. Um, so the maximum build out for the atta and attached plex without parking, so that would be near transit, the setbacks would be the same and they account for about 27% of the lot. So um, even though what's being proposed is 75% lot coverage, um, this scenario actually couldn't um, get quite to 75% coverage. So it's approximately 5,250 square feet. Um, the proposed height would be 35 feet up to um, where the roof pitch starts. Um, and so then it could go up an additional seven feet, like the um, single family, up to a maximum height of 42 feet at the peak. Um, scenario C is more common to what we see as far as single family dwellings. Um, it's approximately 1,830 square foot footprint. Um, it's approximately 29 feet in height, has a 30% lot coverage plus a detached garage. Um, and then scenario D would be maximum build out for a quadplex that would have the required parking. So that would be four parking spaces for a quadplex. So the maximum footprint that you could really get if you're accommodating parking is 2,190 square feet, um, and that's 30% lot coverage. And if you can scroll down a bit, we can look at the, um, what that looks like from the backyard. And so you can see that um, just adding parking um, really affects the amount of coverage that um, a building footprint can accommodate. And so that would be not near transit. Cool, thank you, Jen. And if you'd like to explore what middle housing could look like that's already existing in our neighborhood, Jen also made a great missing middle handbook and we can provide a link to that as well. And now we will hand it over to Jeff to talk about middle housing land divisions. Thanks, Sophie. Um, yeah, so this was a separate uh, Senate bill that came out um, following the uh, passage of House Bill 2001 called Senate Bill 458, which is a little clunky, so we call it middle housing land divisions. And middle housing land divisions are a uh, kind of a new type of land division that's being required to be implemented by the state. And so we're um, applying that locally. And essentially what it's intended to do is to create more opportunities for home ownership uh, when it comes to middle housing specifically. So that's duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, cottage clusters, um, and the like. And specifically, this does not apply to ADUs. I wanna make that very clear. This is for middle housing. And what it allows you to do is essentially, um, when you develop middle housing on a lot, it allows you to draw lines along the lot that allow you to transfer property ownership and essentially divide that lot into separate pieces um, so that those can be sold off. And so uh, just really quickly as examples at the bottom of this slide, you'll see uh, on the left is a duplex and the purple lines kind of show the existing lot and if the homeowner decided they wanted to uh, sell off one of the units of the duplex, you could draw the, the dashed line in red and you'd be able to sell that piece off. And the same thing for the cottage cluster shown on the right. Each one of those cottages could be um, put on its own lot and sold off separately. The 
there are some provisions within the middle housing land divisions, which you see in the bolded list, which uh, show that each lot that you create through a middle housing land division must result in exactly one dwelling on a lot. They all have to have separate utilities. There have to be easements for things like pedestrian access, access to the units, common areas, driveways, parking, things like that. Uh, all of the buildings have to meet the building code. And then the uh, development code standards apply still to the main lot. And what that means is that, and this is something that there's been a lot of confusion around, is that the, for example, on that duplex um, that you see below, the purple lines, the, the what we would call the parent lot, the, the main lot, you still have to meet all of the development standards and the lot standards, it has to be of a certain size, you have to meet setbacks and things like that. The purple lines, you have to meet all those standards for that. And then when you're drawing lines within the purple box for sale purposes, that's when you don't have to meet necessarily things like um, interior and setback or lot size or lot frontage, some of those typical standards that we require for, for what you see on the purple lots. And so if you, if you go to the next slide, this is kind of a, a good example of what you could see with a, a fourplex development. So uh, on the left, you can see that it'd be a fourplex with some parking in the rear and access um, along the, the street that's at the bottom of the screen there. And on the right hand side, you can see that they, you know, you could have this version of the, the quadplex, you could develop it that way, and then come in later and you could draw these pink lines. And essentially those pink lines would allow each unit to be sold off individually to new homeowners. And you also see some pink shaded areas, that's where you would need access easements. And then each one has to have its own utilities. But like I said before, the outside boundaries of, of the parent lot, you know, the, the original lot, those still, you still have to meet applicable setbacks, you have to meet the frontage standards, you have to meet all of the normal development standards for that parent lot, it's just, when you're creating those child lots, you don't necessarily have to meet those when you're just drawing those lines. So with that, I think, uh, here's just a middle housing lot size map. Again, just to demonstrate across Eugene, what the lot sizes look like when you think about where middle housing is proposed to be allowed. So duplexes on lots that are 2,250 square feet triplexes on 3,500 square feet and um, quadplexes on lots that are 4,500 square feet, which you see in green, which covers uh, most of the map here. And just as a note, this map doesn't take into account whether lots are developed or, um, you know, uh, they don't, these aren't the vacant lots around town. This is, these are the just all residential lots throughout Eugene. So with that, I will move to the next slide, which I think I'm handing it back to Sophie at this point. I'm going to come in right here, yeah. actually. Yeah, we made a change <laughs> just to keep you on your toes, Jeff. Um, so we have heard a lot about housing affordability throughout this process. We heard it from every outreach group. We heard it from the Planning Commission and from the community in general. So to help with that, the team prepared a new affordability FAQ, which is on our website and it answers some of the most frequently asked questions about housing affordability. The top question is, can we require new middle housing to be affordable? And the answer is no, we can't do that because that would be a requirement that doesn't apply to single detached dwellings. And the main goal of the house bill is to bring middle housing to the same level playing field as single detached dwellings. However, there are things that we can do to encourage lower cost housing. And some of those things are on this list. The city can allow smaller lots, reduce parking requirements because parking costs a lot, offer density bonuses for owners who choose to keep some units affordable and reduce city fees and property taxes for middle housing. We're still in the process of exploring some of these options, but the top two are wrapped into the draft code that we're discussing right now. Next slide. This is a chart that we borrowed from the Lane County Affordable Housing Action Plan. And I know it's hard to see, but it will be in the PowerPoint that we share. 
and you can find it on the Lane County website if you want to look sooner. The blue box shows example households of a couple earning minimum wage who could afford monthly housing costs, and this is about a year old now, of $1,250. And the other example family is a logging equipment operator who can afford $1,400 in monthly housing costs. The estimated rent and affordability range of what the different options of allow, encourage, and incentivize can produce is shown along the bottom of this slide. The incentivize code package, which has the smallest lots and least requirements, can produce housing affordable to people earning 71 to 89% of area median income. So while these code amendments can't produce the lowest income housing, they can help us establish a set of land use rules that encourage lower cost rental homes and lower cost homes for purchase, especially with the implementation of the middle housing lot divisions under Senate Bill 458, which really allows home ownership of smaller, typically more affordable units than larger single detached units. Oh, one final note on this slide is that at the top, we've added a note that says new single detached dwelling affordability range is off the charts. And I think we've all seen ads for new single family detached dwellings that um, are well above 450 and start, start really in the 300s for most neighborhoods in Eugene. Next slide. Back to Sophie for how to learn more. Thank you, Terry. This is a screenshot of our middle housing webpage. It's eugene-or.gov slash middle housing, all one word. And it has a ton of resources on it. Um, there you can see that you can click on the guide to the adoption process. You can sign up to receive formal mailed notice about the public hearings process. You can also sign up at, through that same link to get informal emails. Um, about the project. There's also an Engage Eugene page where we hosted the survey. However, um, that's a little less active these days, although still updated. Um, there's a ton of consultant uh, work products on the page. There's FAQs, there's fact sheets, there's videos. Um, so I encourage you to check it out. There's a ton of resources on there. And what is coming now? So the big date that we are promoting is the Planning Commission public hearing is on November 16th at 5.30 p.m. Um, and we're hoping that after that, the Planning Commission makes their recommendation to City Council by the end of the calendar year. Then in early 2022, the City Council will have their public hearing. We don't yet have a date for that, but we will share it widely when we do. And then they need to, um, make their decision and have action prior to June 30th, 2022. If they delay their action to after June 30th, 2022, the model code would automatically apply. And of course, we wanna hear from you. So there's a variety of ways of doing that. Um, you can email this email address, middlehousingtestimony at eugene-or.gov. Um, all of that will go into the record for um, the middle housing project. So that's an easy way. You can also email the all of planning commission by sending an email to planning commissioners at eugene-or.gov. And you can email the mayor and city council at mayor council and city manager at eugene-or.gov. And you can provide public testimony um, spoken if you would like to at the planning commission and city council and so the first opportunity to do that would be november 16th at 5 30 pm for the planning commission and we have a lot of opportunities to learn more so i've already promoted the guide to the adoption process um, we're hoping that's a one-stop shop but if you want even more middle housing you can go to eugene-or.gov middle housing you can also sign up for the email list or formal notice. I've created a tiny URL for that. It's tinyurl.com slash MH emails. One just went out yesterday. Um, and staff loves talking to people in the community and answering your questions. And so a good place to start is by emailing me. And if I'm not the person to email, the probably I probably know who to pass it on to. So I'm happy to do that. 
And then I'm going to hand it over to Jeff um, before we open it up for questions to cover some questions that we heard at our first information session, which was on Tuesday. Thanks, Sophie. Yeah, so um, again, I encourage everybody to start typing your questions into the chat and we can start kind of collecting those and getting ready to respond to them. Um, and just uh, I, I did note that we have one person joining by phone, so we'll open it up uh, towards the end for people to ask questions live. Um, without typing those in the chat, but I just I did see that one person was attending my phone. So um, yeah, so at our last meeting, we had a couple of conversations come up and uh, some helpful people called me and asked for clarifications. And those were clarifications that I thought would be nice to give to everybody. So uh, the first one is tree preservation. So um, there's uh, Within our draft code amendments, we are proposing to apply an exemption for the Chapter 9 tree preservation standards for and expanding that to include middle housing. Right now, it only applies to lots that are below 20,000 square feet and are developed with a single family home or a duplex. And we're planning on expanding that to include also tracks that are going to be developed with middle housing as well. And Eugene's tree preservation standards that exist within chapter nine, the land use chapter, um, requires a certified arborist to essentially, when they're proposing to remove trees, they have to consider um, the impact of removing those trees and uh, provide that information to staff. I will note that the um, lots over 20,000 square feet that they can remove five trees annually um, without going through that process as well. So it's really, I think people are primarily concerned with the fact that lots under 20,000 square feet can be developed with middle housing without having to meet the chapter nine tree preservation standards. That being said, I don't wanna overlook the fact that there are, Eugene has a lot of chapters, obviously the land use code chapter, chapter nine, chapter six, of our land use code, which does apply at the time of building permit, does also have tree preservation and removal standards. Those are not proposed to be changed. Those limit people based on the number of trees that they can remove. It requires tree removal permits if you're going to remove more than what you'd be allowed to normally. Um, so I just want to call out that those standards still do exist. So uh, moving on to solar setbacks. This is probably one of the most um, uh, nuanced pieces of code that we have in the land use code. And what solar setbacks are intended to do is to protect access to sunlight, right? So if somebody is going to come in and build a new development, um, is that new development going to shade another property or limit their ability to receive sunlight? And solar setbacks essentially apply to require a building to be set back from the other property in such a way that it wouldn't you know, cast shade onto that property. And that apply, those solar setbacks apply in very, very specific circumstances. And it's essentially applied in those cases where it's most likely that the sun would be blocked by new buildings. So that's, it applies to anything on lots 4,000 square feet or more. And it applies to lots where there's more than 75 feet wide um, on the north-south axis, which is kind of the really confusing part for more, most folks. So essentially it says that if your lot meets those standards, then your building cannot has to be developed in such a way and placed on the lot in such a way that it's, it cannot shade um, the property to the north of you. So, so if you want to stop sharing really quickly, I can share my screen briefly, which has a little graphic that I threw together last minute. So I apologize for the last minute nature of this. Move those out of the way. So here you'll see that we've got, this is kind of what the solar setback does. You can see that it's requiring this building to be located far enough away from this building so that it doesn't cast shade over the entire structure. And you can see that kind of reflected in the same way down here. So like I said, it's on lots that are greater than 4,000 square feet zoned R1 or R2 with a north-south dimension of more than 75 feet. 
Um, there are exceptions for this, such as slopes, existing shade, if your neighbor says it's okay, or if insignificant benefit, like if you're gonna shade a street, that's okay, or if you get it approved through a separate development. So I put together a little graphic here that kind of tries to illustrate this with just a, I just chose a random spot in Eugene. So this top lot here, if you were to develop or expand this house, uh, it does have a north-south dimension of more than 75 feet. So those setbacks would apply, except you can see that they're gonna shade a road. So that's one of those exceptions that would apply. This person, they've got a very long lot, but it's only 70 feet wide on the north-south axis. So those solar setbacks wouldn't apply in that case. And then in this case, on the bottom one, it's 160 feet on the north-south. And so in this case, they would be shading this property to the north of them. So solar setbacks would be applied and they would have to go through that process to make sure that they don't shade out those properties. So I'm gonna stop my sharing there and move on to the next question. So like I said, that's a pretty nuanced one. If anybody wants to follow up with me directly on those solar standards, um, I'm happy to talk about those more. Um, the, Third bullet here is development on narrow or substandard streets. So there's kind of two questions here. One is, can you develop middle housing on a lot that has a narrow or a substandard street? And the answer is yes, um, so long as it is annexed into the city and it meets all of the other development standards, lot standards, things like that. You can develop on a street that is narrow or substandard. Um, but then the question comes to on-street parking. So as Sophie mentioned earlier, you can get on-street parking credits when you have parking available to you. There is a provision within that section that says you cannot claim an on-street parking standard or an on-street parking space, um, essentially eliminating your need to provide parking on-site if you're on a street that is not, does not meet the, the width standards or city of Eugene streets, or if you're located on a street that's not owned or within the city of Eugene. So if you're on, um, for example, some of those properties out in the Santa Clara or River Road neighborhoods, when that street might be in a Lane County right-of-way technically, uh, you wouldn't be able to claim that on-street parking uh, credit. And then the last one is CCNRs, covenants, conditions, and restrictions. Um, these are private, recorded documents that exist on a piece of property that are implemented on a, on a property by property basis. They're not implemented by the city. Um, but when they passed House Bill 2001, they recognized that these covenants, conditions, and restrictions that exist on properties, they're a recorded document that can say a lot of different things. And one of those things it could say is this lot can only ever be developed with a single family house. And if your CCNRs were put in place prior to the adoption of House Bill 2001, that CCNR can stand and you would not be able to develop um, so long as with a, uh, a piece of middle housing if it said that you can't develop middle housing. Um, so long it was, as it was recorded and in place prior to HB 2001. If you went in today and you tried to record a CCNR that said, no middle housing is allowed on my lot. That could not be applied. The, the state specifically called out that that's not all, you can't retroactively try to, to mitigate the development of middle housing on a piece of property. So through the CCNR's property uh, process. So with that, we're gonna turn our actual questions here. Thank you everyone for making it through our recorded presentation. And now we will have time for questions. Um, Jeff is going to go through the chat and facilitate it. Um, so Jeff, I will hand it over to you. Thanks Sophie. Um, I'm actually gonna ask a question that I think I'll toss right back to you. And it's one of the first ones we got in the chat. And it was asking, um, it pointed out that our market housing fact sheet in, uh, documents barriers to things that include parking. So has the city considered removing parking minimums in order to increase the 
feasibility of triplex, quadplex, and other middle housing development. Yeah, so um, the proposed code um, proposes to not require minimum parking standards for um, units that are built close to transit, which is within a quarter mile of frequent transit networks, and units that are um, under 900 square feet in size. And the idea behind that is to um, encourage smaller, more affordable units. Um, there's also some more um, some more possible regulations coming down from the state regarding parking that will uh, happen in 2023, I believe, through the Climate Friendly and Equitable Cities rulemaking process, which I can put a link to in the chat. Um, so the short answer is yes, in certain cases. And the long answer is um, there's still some stuff potentially coming later on, um, but we're keeping our eye on that. Um, Jeff, did you have anything to add to that? Oh, that was perfect. Um, and I just threw the link in the chat for everybody if you're interested in the climate friendly and equitable communities rulemaking. Um, oh, Jeff, that's also a good time to say there's an information session for climate friendly and equitable cities rulemaking tomorrow night. Um, so if you're interested in that, um, you can go to another night meeting about planning this week. Great. Thanks, Sophie. Um, uh, Gabrielle asked if all, when you're looking for to get some of the incentives through having these small units, uh, that's the, if you create units that are below 900 square feet, um, she asked if that needs to be all units or just some of them, and then talking about what you do if you're going to retrofit an existing home or a larger home. And so the rules for those incentives are essentially accounts, they ask you to figure out the average unit size. And there's some specific calculations within there to say, okay, my average unit size is gonna be 900 square feet. So if you have a really large existing single detached house on your lot, you'll have to create some smaller units to account for that size. Um, or you could uh, convert portions of that existing single detached unit into pieces of middle housing. So if you're going to convert a large single home into a quadplex or something like that, um, that would obviously reduce that size as well. So we got another question here about porches. And I think I might actually toss this one to Jen. If Jen's prepared to answer about porches. Sure, I can answer that. I did answer it in the chat as well. So the um, the rendering that I spoke through um, in the video, um, the, there were porches on each of the buildings and those are not required um, as part of the code. Um, the code as far as design elements is really pretty limited and plexes um, are only required to meet the code standards that are currently required for single family or single dwellings. Thanks, Jen. So, uh, Gabriel asked another question about how much we, do, do we have an estimate for how much land divisions will cost for the legal division? So this is looking at middle housing land divisions and if you're gonna uh, segregate a small, or a lot into smaller lots for each unit of middle housing. And the whole idea behind the state legislation or the state law around middle housing land divisions was to create an expedited process. So the whole idea was to make it cheaper than it currently is. Um, you currently have two options to go through and create a middle housing land division. And that would be a full partition process, which is a pretty involved two-step land use process. Or you can condominiumize your property, which is a very expensive process with insurance and planning regulations and things like that. So the expedited process kind of does two things for middle housing land divisions. Its goal is to create a really, really simple, like black and white, do you do it? Do you meet the standards? And if so, a okay. The thing is, is it still does require a plat. So there's still costs associated with getting a surveyor to prepare and create your application for the middle housing land division. Um, and then there's whatever other fees that are associated with having people help you go through that process. But the 
The primary idea is to make this a much easier and much simpler process so the average person can take it on, um, albeit with the help of a surveyor for their plot. So I don't have numbers on the actual estimate, but the intent behind the process is to, to really try to make it easier. And one important thing I'll say about middle housing land divisions is you can currently do it for a duplex. Um, so you can currently partition a duplex on a lot into two separate lots for sale purposes. And under the current proposal, that's gonna go away because it's a much more involved and difficult process than the middle housing land division would be. So the, the intent is to actually um, have this apply to not only new middle housing, but also existing. So that's another positive benefit there. Um, my next question, I think I'll toss to Terry. Terry, do you know the number of lots that are within a quarter mile of frequent transit corridors? Oh, I'm glad it wasn't the utilities question because I was going to ask you to answer those questions. Um, <laughs> there are some ones about utilities. But as far as frequent transit, I do not know the lot count, but I put a couple of links in the chat that are options that are on the table for defining what near transit means. And so I apologize, I couldn't figure out a way to just put the pictures of the options in the chat. That would have been handy. <laughs> uh, but there are a couple of links in there to a planning commission presentation and a PDF that is the code itself. And so that has a series of maps that are in the published code. Um, it's, it's quite a lot because we have frequent transit on a number of main streets in Eugene. So a quarter mile on either side is quite a lot, but I don't know the percentage. And then I'll say that once you do navigate to the two options that are under consideration, it's also possible to combine those two maps. So there was a lot of interest, at, at least at the planning commission level, in um, spreading incentives and opportunities as far and as wide across the community as possible. So they were interested in hearing what people think of these two options, but also potentially combining them um, to maximize the part of the community that would be covered. Great, thanks, Terry. Um, so David asked a question about, uh, he has an existing house and his big question is around utilities. And if he's gonna convert his existing single detached home and turn it into a duplex. Um, is it does it require him to create two utility connections? And the um, he's not interested in selling these. He just wants to rent one house. So they're going to be on the same lot. And I actually do not know the answer to that. Within the land use code, there's no requirement for there to be a separate utility connection. However, I I am curious if there's a building code requirement that would or or eweb requirement that would require there for it to be separate utility connections. From my experience, I think in almost every case, I've seen a separate utility connection developed. So I would imagine that that's required. Um, but I will have to get back to, uh, maybe I can add that to our FAQ or something like that to respond to that question directly. And I can get back to David um, personally. And the other question about utilities was in, in the situation of a middle housing land division. So one of the, criteria for middle housing land divisions is that each unit has its own utilities. And the question was whether if you put four units on a lot, can, do you have to have each utility being connected straight out to the street? So if a water line's in the street, do you have to connect each single unit directly to that pipe in the street? And there's nothing within the middle housing land use regulations that would require you to be able to not have those shared for a certain distance and then plug into the same thing. However, there might be requirements for that through eWeb's policies and requirements. And the same goes for wastewater lines, which chapter six, I think may require a separate wastewater line for each unit. Um, so that's another one where it's a little bit outside of what we're changing through the land use regulations, but it's an important clarification that I'll wanna to add to that um, scenario so that people have a good understanding of what costs are gonna be coming their way. So I'll be happy to look those up and add a little bit of uh, clarity to those situations around utilities. And I think Sophie, you had a question that was asked directly to you if you wanted to read that one. 
It was also asked to everyone. I didn't read far enough and you already got to it. So great job. Awesome. Um, There's another question about middle housing lot divisions though, Jeff. Um, do you have an estimate for how much land divisions will cost just for the legal division, not counting the separate utilities mentioned by David? And do you think that this will actually pencil out at current land values? These questions are so interesting tonight. Yeah, and I touched on that a little bit, um, but generally speaking, we don't have the perfect estimate for what that would cost. Um, it's gonna depend on who you count, because you do need a survey or different surveyors and different costs. And it's just hard to estimate that. From a land use planning perspective, we will have to create a new fee. We don't have a fee for that process right now. So we will be going through that to establish a fee for the city of Eugene's review of that application. Um, but given that it's intended to be an expedited process, hoping that it'll be easier and therefore cheaper. That's the idea. Can I just add something to that answer, which is um, these comments and questions are really helpful, especially um, from folks who have experience in the development process, because when we're considering changing the land use code, but somebody has a piece of knowledge because they've been through our process and had to deal with eWeb in the past, that's helpful to us. We have heard some of these same things as we've been working on the rules and how this would apply in Eugene. We've had some conversations with folks who very similar to this line of questions where they're trying to figure out how to fit multiple units on a lot and asking questions about utilities. So this is all super helpful for us and um, helps us find places where we might have overlooked an unintended consequence or something that doesn't quite get fixed by the land use code. Um, it, there could be additional barriers to providing middle housing that we can learn about and then help shepherd through um, process changes or things that happen in other parts of the city organization. So I just shout out to people who are calling those to our attention. Thanks, Terry. Um, Jason asked a good question and it is, are the requirements for cottages the same as attached multifamily units? And so um, Jason's talking about our cottage cluster standards and cottage cluster standards, just for everybody's benefit, a cottage cluster specifically is four or more units that are all detached on a lot with a common courtyard of some kind and of a certain size based on the requirements. No, the standards for multifamily do not apply to cottage clusters. There's a different set of regulations that apply that govern things like um, your height's limited to 25 feet, your there's a certain amount of area per cottage that you have to have within your common courtyard. They all have to be connected by um, sidewalks and things like that. The multifamily standards, that's five or more units on the same lot. That's in, Those are really built for garden style apartment complexes. So you have things like landscape buffers and parking area standards and things like that. They're, they're meant for these large apartment complexes. And so we specifically defined cottage clusters to not be multifamily. So if you, have, like I said, multifamily is five units on the same lot. Well, you could have a cottage cluster with 10 units, but as long as you call it a cottage cluster, you get to go under those easier standards for cottage clusters that are meant to kind of create common courtyards and a nice small community. Um, so they are intended to be a little bit easier. Let's see here. Gail Baker asked a question, would proposed middle housing code changes incentivize replacement of existing affordable housing with new construction that will be less affordable? Terry or Sophie, do either of you want to tackle that one? Yeah, I can try. I'm just going to read it over again. They incentivize replacement of existing affordable housing with new construction that will be less affordable. This is a big concern that we've heard from a lot of folks, and we tried to get at this issue in the affordability FAQ that we published. Um, the number one requirement of the House bill is to allow more types of housing, and that will have effects on displacement. It will have it will cause redevelopment of some existing housing, um, but it is not an issue that is unique to middle housing. 
and we're not allowed under the legislation to do anything with middle housing that is more um, restrictive than, than we do for single dwellings. So that is to say, this is a concern and there are strategies the city is considering for dealing with gentrification and displacement, um, while also trying to encourage the affordability of new housing as much as we can. So one of the slides we showed in the video was the income ranges and um, where new housing would hope to provide more options for both renters and homeowners in the moderate income ranges. It's not going to get down to the deepest levels of affordability, although we are also considering some uh, density bonus uh, programs or provisions if property owners choose to keep some of the units affordable to people with restricted income. So I know that's a lot, but th this is a really big concern. I just want to say that um, we're trying to think of every way we can to address this while still bringing middle housing to a level playing field with single development, which is kind of the overarching goal of the legislation. I'll just add to that. There's um, there's another bill passed um, in 2019, the same year as House Bill 2001. It's House Bill 2003, and that will um, that's more aligned with affordable housing and um, outlining and planning for affordable housing needs. Um, and then there is another project going on at the city called the HIP, the Housing Implementation Pipeline. Um, and so there is certainly a lot of work to try to tackle this issue. And um, unfortunately, there's no uh, one project to solve everything. Um, so we're working together and making sure we stay in contact with our community development partners, um, because this is something we do want to get on top of. Awesome. Thank you for answering those. Um, Jason asked a question about the partition process. And he said, is it much less expensive than the subdivision process? Will this be the same under House Bill 2001? And he clarifies that, would it be cost prohibitive to divide into four lots rather than three under the middle housing guidelines? Um, so in terms of the fee, we haven't determined our fee structures. And just to, let me back up before I even go there. Uh, Jason is obviously pretty familiar with the actual rules that exist within the world of dividing land because there's two different types of land divisions. One is three lots and the, uh, the rest of them are four or more lots. And so a partition is three lots um, or less than three lots and a subdivision is more than three lots, so four or more. And typically a subdivision is much more expensive just because you're creating a lot more lots and a partition is less expensive. Uh, as I discussed earlier, the expedited process, the fees will likely be lower because there's not as much review required. Um, when it comes to how much, I'm going to guess that we will have a different cost for partitions and subdivisions. However, I think it will be substantially lower than the current fees associated with partitions and subdivisions. Um, look for more information on that as we kind of get closer to the actual implementation and those fees are fully flushed out. Um, let's see, Clay asked a question. I've heard complaints from neighbors that tree protections are being removed within the proposed code changes. And his understanding is a little differently. Can you clarify the proposed code changes to tree protections within the code? Yeah, so um, I talked about this a little, a little bit in the video, but essentially um, the way that tree preservation is currently applied within the realm of land use, where what we're talking about here today, um, on lots under 20,000 square feet, single detached homes and duplexes are exempt from the tree preservation standards. We're planning on expanding that to include all middle housing development. So all middle housing on lots that are 20,000 square feet or less would be exempt from the chapter nine land use tree preservation standards. Um, Lots greater than 20,000 square feet get to remove five trees a year. That said, 
we so we are changing tree preservation standards and their applicability within the land use code. There's a whole other section within chapter six of Eugene's code, which is about tree preservation and the environment. And we are not changing anything within that. So if you're gonna be coming in for the removal of trees as part of a project under chapter six, you'll still be required to get necessary permitting for those removal of trees. So it's no, we're not removing all tree preservation standards associated with this. Those still do exist within chapter six of the Eugene's land use code. So. Hopefully that clarifies it just a little bit in terms of um, what's being required and what tree preservation standards are, are still going to exist. And I'm happy to follow up with anybody about that. Okay, let's see. I don't actually, I think, did you guys see any leftover questions in the chat that we haven't had quite yet? You might have already addressed this. Um, Jason said to clarify their last question, would it be cost prohibitive to divide into four lots rather than three under the middle housing guidelines? Maybe do you wanna to touch on how um, middle housing land divisions are uh, separate than partitions and subdivisions? Yeah, so this is actually pretty interesting. Uh, like just to expand on this a little more than I did earlier. Um, there's been a law within the state that's existed for quite a long time, actually, called the expedited land use process. And it's never been locally codified, and we're actually planning to codify it locally now to make it more clear that people can take advantage of this. And it's essentially, um, for anybody that's familiar with kind of our really, really burdensome land use processes that we have here, um, or I, when I say burdensome, I mean in terms of time, um, this process is intended to speed that process up in terms of how much time the city has to review things, how long the city has to um, make their decision on items and, and the opportunity to appeal and how much notice goes out and things like that. So this expedited process, which has existed statewide and could have been called upon, um, is now being codified at a different level. And so you'll see within the draft code amendments, a very large section of them towards the bottom are actually addressing those new rules and requirements for um, essentially a new type of land use approval. And that would be the expedited land division or middle housing land division. Um, so that's a pretty, it's actually an exciting process for us to get more clear so that when people are using our code locally, it will be easier for them to navigate and not have to go look at state law. Those are all the questions I see in the chat and something we've done in our past information sessions um, is just open it up for you to unmute yourself or raise your hand and get your voice in the room. We've taken up a lot of space tonight. Um, so if you have Especially, a question. Um, this could be a good time to do that poll too. Oh, thank you. Um, this is going to be a brief time to, to launch a poll. We wanna know what's been working as far as our communications. So I'm going to launch a poll right now, asking how you heard about tonight. Um, so if you would like to, you can answer. Somebody has said a community organization. Another person said other. I'll just leave it up for a little bit while folks answer. Um, but thank you for letting us know. Um, we always want to improve. And if you have any suggestions for other avenues of communication that we could utilize, um, we would always love to hear. And I see Jason has their hand up. Thank you, Sophie. Um, and thanks to all of the city staff. You guys have done a fantastic job of navigating a huge task and it's impressive um, and I really appreciate it. So my question, you, you touched on CCNRs a bit and uh, and that's great. Um, you know, with, with multifamily housing, when you subdivide multifamily housing, you, you, you tend to have to deal with some, so, some form of HOA to address uh, maintenance issues on, on, on things that are common between the building, siding, roofing, whatever, et cetera. Does the middle house, does HB 2001 address HOAs at all? That's a, that's a really good question. And so just to, like typically um, in a large apartment complex, the HOA does things like landscaping too and a lot of these other items. And uh, the middle housing land divisions do not require an HOA necessarily. Um, what, is, what would be required if you have attached units? So 
um, if you have a shared wall or something that, like that between two units, you'd be required to have a maintenance agreement between those two units. It wouldn't necessarily encumber a whole lot. So uh, let's say, for example, you want to build a fourplex and two of those units are going to be in the back, detached, separate from all other structures, but the two units in the front are going to be attached. Those two units in the front would need to be have an agreement between them that says that we will share the cost of maintenance and that all necessary aspects of um, that. And that's something that currently exists. When you go to divide a duplex, you have to, you essentially, those are required as well. Okay, thank you. Um, so yeah, as, that's a pretty interesting question, but otherwise there aren't like for landscaping and site management and things like that, those aren't, there's no required HOA for those purposes. Okay. Um, the easements and agreements kind of take care of those needs. Great question. Thank you. David. Yeah, I, I've missed some basic concept here. Middle housing land division. I'm, I'm, I'm able to divide the area. I need to legally plat out, right? Have it done to do this, but I'm not selling these. I'm not, I'm still the owner of this property, correct? You, correct, yeah. So you, That's yeah, kind of so basic, you don't but need, I, somehow. Yeah. Um, let me specify that the you could turn your house into a duplex, not a problem, and it can just be on one lot and it's a duplex. The whole intent with the land division process is to essentially allow you, if you wanted to, to sell off one half of that. The state law that implemented that was essentially saying we want to get more people the opportunity to own their home and build wealth through home ownership, and so they're saying well, it's kind of hard if you're always having to rent. So maybe if we allow people to easily just sell off one piece of a fourplex or something, it'll give people an opportunity to kind of build wealth through that, owning that piece of that quadplex or fourplex. Does that make sense? Yeah, so if I, let's say I did um, divide this house. I mean, for me, dividing a house is just having a legal kitchen area, really. I mean, it's really what, I don't have to really, I mean, if we need to do firewalls and all that, that's fine. And fire exits will be fine because of the layout. But then if I want to bring in like, I guess an ADU manufactured home, talked about boxable, there, they, that is a, a you can, I can do that under ADU. But if I have two of those and they have a kitchen, then I'm going into middle housing. Is that correct or? Yeah, so I'll just kind of specify really quickly that an accessory dwelling unit is accessory to a single detached home. So if you have a duplex on a piece of property, you're not permitted an ADU as well under the current way that the code is written. Now, if your lot's big enough, you could have your two attached units in the front and a separate unit in the back, and it would just be a triplex. So it is big enough. It is. Okay. Um, so that's another option in terms of if you were just looking to have three units on the lot that way, um, depending on, because I think, if I recall, you said your lot was like 7,000 square feet. 75. Yeah, so okay. in, in that case, you could have a four, you could have four units on your lot um, and be a fourplex uh, in that scenario, because currently we're, the proposed code is allowing five, four units on anything 5,000 square feet or greater. And they could be rentals. Correct. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. Or I typed this in, but maybe I'll just say it aloud since we're talking out loud. Um, in Portland, the ADU code, at least like five years, few years ago, when I was looking into it, allowed for shared utilities and you could meter or you could not meter. Um, but, and I don't even know if that's the case in Eugene, but I'm assuming that that's again, not allowed with the middle housing. That's um, a question for middle housing that I'm gonna to have to look into a little bit. If it's required, if you go through the lane division process, but otherwise I need to get everybody a clear answer on whether that'd be required for just a, a conversion or, or a situation like that. I think generally speaking on new construction, you would be required to have two separate utility connections. But for, for a conversion, that's my that's what I what's unknown to me. Thank you. Yeah. And Terry corrected me. I, uh, 
fourplex under the current code is allowed on 4,500 square feet, not 5,000. Thanks, Terry. Oh, it's got my back. Um, I might jump in as someone who was um, on the DLCD Technical Advisory Committee, where throughout the process, we kind of felt hamstrung a lot of the time by the way the law had actually been written and saying, ooh, we wish they had a technical advisory committee before they wrote this law. Um, and so there were certain limits beyond which we felt we really couldn't go because of the way the law was written. And I'm really pleased to see that the city is sort of going beyond that. I mean, one of my biggest worries was the whole jumping back and saying, well, we, you know, the whole detached versus attached, which I think is a huge issue. And I'm really pleased to see that Eugene is proposing that we sort of allow the detached units as of right, because it just makes so much more sense in terms of site planning on a lot of specific sites. So that's really great. And I'm also really pleased to see the way the city is thinking about incentivizing affordable housing and coming up with um, you know, reduced lot sizes and all of that relating to those things. So I, th I think you guys have just done a, you know, a great job with this this year. Thanks, Peter. I, I really appreciate that comment. And, you know, it's been really helpful to go through this process with the guidance of our public involvement plan and the planning commission really helping us get to a point where we were able to bring forward this uh, set of draft code amendments that, um, you know, we believe really meets the intent of, of what the state law was trying to do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, based on Eugene's anti-development reputation, I was expecting something a lot more <laughs> So thank you so much. <laughs> um, yeah. There, there was that aspect of the default code that was generally referred to as the Eugene provision. And it's kind of nice to see that Eugene is not going in the direction of having to use, you know, that having to be used to force Eugene to do something. It's, it's pretty great. Thanks for that perspective. <laughs> hey, Jeff, I, or all of you, I have, I have one more question just to clarify. Uh, the, 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 the distinction I was trying to make before regarding cottages, uh, from what I'm understanding from this conversation is that the, the middle house allows for triplexes or quads to be detached or attached, is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely correct. Okay. Under the current proposal, that's allowed for duplexes, triplexes, or fourplexes. Um, townhomes are naturally, by definition, attached units. And then cottage, cottages are required to be detached. That's pretty good. Right. And, and yet the, 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 all the standards for 50 feet of street frontage and, and the parking we've discussed, all that is, has, has gone away. It's going away. So street, there are still street frontage standards um, for, so the, let me specify, when you're just developing new middle housing, um, you, there's still things like street frontage standards, lot width standards, lot coverage standards, those all still exist. Um, the time when they, when they don't apply it is when you're trying to split up using the middle housing land division because that parent, the big lot will still have to meet those things, but each individual little tiny lot doesn't have to. Right. So the parent lot has to have the 50 feet of street frontage, all that, but beyond that, the, the, the child lots can, it's, it's, I'm just having a hard time wrapping my head around this because we've, we've been working within these pair, this paradigm for so long, it's, it's, it's wild. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh it's basically you know the the parent lot where you develop this the whole the whole concept is to maintain um, standards and Sophie really just she put in a great uh, the guide to the adoption process um, that link that she just put in the chat has actual tables that say like for duplexes the lot frontage requirement was this it, or was required by state to be this and this is what we're proposing currently. Um, so that's really helpful to see what that is. But the idea behind a parent lot, you know, we want to make sure that the setbacks still exist. We want to make sure that the lots still meet certain standards. Um, but it's the middle house, the, the middle housing child lots. When you're trying to draw these little boxes for home ownership, you want to be able to just chop it out of there and get it out. And so you can't necessarily have frontage if, if a piece of the fourplex is in the back. Yeah. Um, so that's where those don't, don't apply. 
And then, you know, for things like duplexes, which are now allowed on lots of 2,250 square feet, naturally because the, tr the old lot frontage requirement was always 50 feet, right? So we had to reduce that to account for the fact that if you, had a, if you required 50 feet of frontage, your lot's gonna end up being real long and short. So and squat. So we don't we amended that to reduce some of the frontages to make it more of a reality for some of those smaller lots. Great. And I'll also say that um, the link I put in the chat also has instructions for how to provide your comments. Um, so we would love to hear all comments. Um, I know that it's uh, not at is easy to show up to another meeting and potentially wait a bit to provide your comment. Um, so you can provide written comments, you can provide verbal comments. If you provide comments to staff, we can put them in the official place that comments go. Um, so just would really love to continue gathering input throughout this adoption process. And um, really great to hear all of your questions tonight. Looks like we have a couple more minutes. Um, then I also wanna say that um, staff are just always available for questions. Um, so. Um, I can put our email addresses in the chat. I'll also be putting the recording on YouTube and on the city's webpage as long, along with the um, chat transcript so you can get all the links later. Um, but please feel free to give us a call. Um, most of us are working remotely still, so you can leave us a voicemail and we'll call you back. Um, you can also send us emails. We love to chat and answer your questions. And as Terry said, your questions are really so helpful um, because we just can't get everything no matter how hard we try. So we appreciate it when people flag things for us. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to give a shout out. This is the best public involvement in the state on House Bill 2001. Good job. <laughs> yeah, well, job. well done. Thank you. Good meeting. Have a good evening. Thanks, Peter. Thank you. <laughs>